kind of work for a while, we kind of can see our way through the process. The people we're working with don't, but it's key because you can present it as, um, if you present it as this is easy, you, in some ways you're undermining yourself because then the perception might be, well, if it's so easy, I guess we don't really need you. You know, yeah. we'll, um, we'll listen to you for a little bit and then we'll just go do it. Uh, and so I think it's that tight line between sharing expertise and, um, and getting people to buy into the longer term effort and not just the 45 minute introduction and then having them walk away going, Oh, well, yeah, well, you've convinced me we can do this yeah. and we can do it without you. <laughs> yeah. So. You don't want people to feel like they can just get on YouTube and watch like, you know, right. someone else's free content. And then we're like, well, we don't need Steve, but yeah. giving them the feeling specifically that I'm an expert, I'm a credible authority, and therefore I'm going to make this process fluent. Like right. you're the gatekeeper to fluency. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good distinction to make. Well, yeah. and a, a variation on that that I find is that the quicker I can uh, extract an example out of a group and talk about that, then they're leaning in because you're now talking about them. You're not just talking in abstract concepts anymore. You're talking about their particular challenge that they're wrestling with and offering some insights. And then they, they tend, and maybe this is your, part of your concreteness thing, no, <laughs> but, no, um, but it, it, it's just an example of um, people like to hear about themselves and, exactly. so, you know, you know, and so the more time you spend talking about them and the less time you spend talking about yourself, I find uh, seems to resonate with people. You're exactly right. And Nick's bringing up something called implicit egoism, which means that by design, our brains are, you know, give more attention to things and are attracted to information that has to do with us because our brains are designed to protect us and help us be a little bit self-serving to survive. And so, yeah, if you're um, another really great persuasion tactic is making sure that you include information that has to do with your target, your persuasion target, because they will be more likely to buy in and pay attention to that information. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm going to have to uh, step away in a, about uh, 10 minutes. So Yeah, okay, no problem. We're just wrapping up here with concreteness. So yes. third persuasion tactic is concreteness. So what is this? It's one of the most effective ways to get people to buy in and help them remember something. It's concreteness is all about turning something abstract into something easier to wrap our minds around. And if you're a consultant and you're an entrepreneur, like we all four are, sometimes we work with pretty complicated processes. I know all, all of you guys do and I do too. So why is this important? Because novices crave concreteness. People who don't know a lot about a, sub, a specific subject, they need concreteness examples to help them understand and remember. Um, people are less likely to buy into things that they're uncertain about. So you want to make sure that in order to get people to buy into something, you offer them concrete examples um, so you decrease their uncertainty. So studies suggest that people are a lot better at remembering words that describe concrete items, like uh, words like system. That's a very ambiguous and general term. They're a lot better at remembering words like pencil because that's a very concrete, easy to wrap your mind around example. Um, so, let's talk about how we actually create that feeling of concreteness. So how do we make ideas more concrete in our message? First, we have to be more specific. So one way to do this is think about the goal, um, the end result, what you're promising to give these people if they buy in and describe it in very concrete terms. So Nick, how do you describe the end results? Um, that your clients will get in very concrete terms or how would you what when you're talking to a client and you um, imagine what they could be if they work with you what does that look like what does that feel like and maybe we can figure out how you'd make that more concrete yeah so the simplest um, explanation I give is that I help schools and their communities figure out where they are educationally and where they would like to be educationally and then if there are facility impacts in relation to that, I help them figure out how to get a, a better fit. And if that involves design teams, I help 
make those design teams more effective on behalf of the client. So mm -hmm. I, I try to, that's my quickest explanation of what I can give people. Yeah. Um, it, the, the other more specific things that sometimes I'll do is talk about, I have eight basic ways I can help you save money right, right. off the bat. Yeah. And um, I find that um, schools that use those techniques uh, uh, save way more money than they would ever spend on my consulting effort. That's um, great. You know, That's so much like more that. concrete. Yeah, and and I have more specific stories about a superintendent in Phoenix, Arizona, that I helped in a three-minute consultation save a million dollars on furniture. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, so fantastic. so instead of them doing just general arm-waving stories, you know, I tried to I actually wrote them all down so that I would remember them <laughs> when I was um, before going in to talk to somebody. So that's uh, awesome. Ha have them at the ready to share. Um, that's a really great example. Um, cause you started out by describing your service as helping people educationally. And that's like educationally is a word that, you know, that can mean so many different things. And what is the end result? I don't know what that looks like, what that feels like, but saying here are eight ways I help you make more money. That is so much more persuasive and something that would make me buy in so mm -hmm. much more because I can imagine the feeling of money See, looking at the school district bank account and Mm -hmm. And I know what that looks and feels like. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Steve, here's a, a question for you. When you are talking to potential clients of yours, what does that end result that you give them, what would that look and feel like? Um, what has change done well in their organization um, concretely? What does that look and feel like? So, so we're going to uh, eliminate or minimize the amount of resistance that's going to uh, that people are going to display across the, uh, the the board, we're going to get people to have a greater buy-in and taking ownership of the change, and we're going to shorten and compress the time frame that that change takes place. So, really, three things. Okay, so those are. It's great that you have three things. So, I think that those would be even more persuasive if they were even a little bit more concrete. So here's an example of, um, I was workshopping with a colleague of mine and he basically um, creates apps that help manage information. And that I have worked with him for like a year and I still didn't really even know what he did because he never described it in very concrete terms. And so um, some other people, we kind of helped him come up with a way of describing his job at, instead of um, I manage information with IT. We said, he said, think of all the pieces of paper you touch throughout your work day. I make it so that you don't have to touch those pieces of paper and instead they live on your computer in files that are easy to find. And so that was like a really a way to take something a little bit abstract and make it super concrete. So if we're going to take one of those things to start with that you, those end results that you described, um, you said um, removing resistance. So how can we talk about it in a little bit more of a concrete way so that we could picture it in our minds or we could hear it? Um, and you said you're visual, so what does that actually look like in the workspace so that you could describe it for a potential client? Yeah, so uh, I'm just like rambling yeah. uh, out, out here, but uh, so there's always naysayers and there's people who are going to be like, oh, I don't like this, I don't like this, and I'm going to go directly after those people and I'm gonna figure them out. I have the ability to figure them out right away and identify those people and go in and listen to them and let them tell me what the issue is and, and tackle resistance head on. That's fantastic. Know. That's great because um, if you were to ask people who in your life is a naysayer, like picture someone in your life who's like a negative Nancy or a naysayer, that would make that result so much more concrete for me and, and easier to buy in. Um, we want to think about the most ambiguous or uncertain part of what we're asking people to buy into and make that very concrete and easy to picture and feel and imagine wrap our minds around. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Cool. If, I could, if I could do it in a way that like plants the seed and say, okay, you guys all have naysayers in your office. Do not tell me who they are. 
I'm going to go in there and figure them. I'm going to be able to spot those people a mile away, and I'm going to go right after them. Now, you can tell me if you want, but if you don't tell me, it's okay, because I'm going to figure out who they are right away, because they they stick out like a big shining bulb to me. I, yeah. I, I know who these people are. So Yeah, yeah. And, and that's I, amusing I, fluency, too. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I was going to say, and I'm going to step away, but um, I think there's some other ways to say all of those same things, which is... Um, Steve is someone who can uh, read people well, you know, that he understands uh, the kind of basic characteristics that people are um, communicating to others. Um, and you could also make, I'm just thinking of a simple visual, which is typically there's a third of a group that you're working with that has already embraced the future and is waiting for everybody else to catch up. <laughs> And there's the third that are actively resisting any change. And then it's the middle third that you're trying to kind of move, uh, knowing that those most resistant ones will either retire or eventually get on board when they realize significant change is underway. Um, so, so there could be a simple graphic of the third, the third, the third. Um, like, but, but also, yeah. I think if you can weave into that, the, I'm good at reading people. Um, because then it um, it kind of assures people around you that um, you're going to be an asset to their organization because you're going to be able to see interactions between people that maybe they don't see because they're in it all the time. Yes. Um, and so that kind of outsider who can see well is, is important. Um, I'm going to go, but okay. this was fun. Thanks, Nick. So, all right. You. Yep. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. See ya. All right. Adios. Bye. Bye. So, um, Steve, you were talking about using visuals earlier, which is fantastic. And that's actually the second way that we can make things more concrete. And Nick just gave you a great suggestion about um, those, the third, thirds example of people who are ready to buy in, not so ready to buy in. Um, because, and I think that concreteness might be the most important tactic for you that we're talking about because change management and working with organizations, they're by nature kind of abstract. Like even when I was studying organizational communication, I often had a hard time picturing what we're talking about. Um, so here's an example that I really like about creating imagery and making things more concrete using visuals and sound. So back in the 80s, um, an organization called the Beyond War Movement came about. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Beyond War, but basically they're an organization that was opposing arms deals um, and nuclear war. So they, uh, organized volunteers to go around to people's houses and get them to oppose nuclear war. Um, so how could they make their argument more concrete and credible? Because um, nuclear war is kind of hard for people to imagine. And how can you make nuclear bombs more of a concrete concept in people's homes? They came up with a very persuasive way to use the concreteness tactic. They um, had people host house parties um, with the Beyond War movement and made a little demonstration. So they had a metal bucket sitting on the floor and someone will get up and drop one BB, a metal BB into the metal bucket and say, we're gonna imagine that this is the Hiroshima bomb from World War II and kind of describe what that devastation looked like and drop that BB in the bucket and you kind of hear that BB clang around in there. And then they would drop, drop 10 additional metal BBs into the metal bucket, which is kind of loud and you hear that crashing around in the bucket and say, that's the power of one nuclear submarine from the US or the Soviets. And then would drop 5,000 BBs in a bucket to symbolize the 5,000 nuclear warheads that were in existence at the time between the U.S. and the Soviets, just to kind of make concrete by imagery and sound the scale of this really kind of big abstract idea. So that made destruction easier to understand and made the whole um, conversation a little bit more meaningful. So if we can kind of, and this takes kind of workshopping and creative thinking, but if you were to move one step further and have a visual and some kind of demonstration and you're like the guy to do demonstrations and skits, like you said, um, thinking about those ambiguous and kind of uncertain results and how you can make them more concrete using sound, using visuals, that would be really persuasive, I think. Hey, Andrew, I see you on there. I don't know if you're, um, you're muted too, but um, welcome to our conversation here. We're actually, just wrapped up talking about the concreteness tactic. Anybody have any questions about that or we want to workshop anything in the last couple minutes we have here? 
cool. Okay, so general questions I can answer about what we talked about tonight, which was authority and fluency, how we make ourselves more credible, how we make buying in seem very easy or concreteness, how we make buying in very simple. Yes, Steve. I, I, uh, it's not so much a question as, as just sort of a comment. I, yeah. uh, what I really liked about this, uh, Micah, is that um, in all three of the areas, I can see where I've, I've been doing like a couple of them. Good. And, and I, I can see where, like, it's like, okay, let's just turn the volume up on those things and make sure that that's what people are hearing. And, uh, and so, um, so this is helpful. So this is like very much like a, like, like helping me, you know, in some ways I feel like I'm, I'm kind of going in the right direction, but yeah. it's, like, it's like, you're giving me a, a sharper path to, to follow. So that's fantastic. You. Great, Steve. That's what I like to hear. And like we, talked about in the opening of this discussion, persuasion is about making just subtle changes and a lot of times the things that you're already doing. And so it's like you said, turning up the volume knob a little bit on things. And I suspect that you're going to see more buy-in once you fine tune those things a little bit. It's not making massive change. It's, it's knowing, having a third person come in, me, and saying, you're already doing it. You're doing it right. Let's just enhance what you're already doing. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. So again, to summarize, we talked about the authority tactic or how you can increase your expertise. And once you're an authority figure, people are a lot more likely to buy into your requests, how we can use fluency. So making um, buy into your requests very, very easy and give people the feeling of flow or ple pleasure and buying in and concreteness, making your requests and what you're offering very easy for people to wrap their minds around. So again, these were three easy ways that you can get people to say yes to your request, get them to buy in. And it sounds like we already have some great takeaways. I know Nick left with some notes. Um, he's a notes guy like me, taking notes on everything. So what is the relevance of this? Well, I know we, in general, as entrepreneurs, we don't always feel like we want to sell to people. We don't like feeling like salespeople. And traditional sales is intimidating. It can be aggressive and once people know they're being sold to, they tend to kind of shut down and resist. And persuasion is the opposite of sales. Great for introverts, great for people who um, would rather have a conversation than a sales pitch because you can create those relationships and you can create long-term buy-in with people and foster those relationships. So thank you guys so much for tuning into the webinar. It was nice to have a small group so we could actually like workshops and stuff and have a great conversation. And if you're not on the mailing list, you can text APIS, please, to 22828 to get the link to um, this recording on YouTube and get other tips and YouTube videos. And if you haven't taken the quiz on my website, apiscommunicationscience.com, make sure you do that and you'll get um, recommendations for which easy persuasion tactics you should be using to get people to buy in. Thank, Thank you so you much, guys. And uh, send me an email if I can answer any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, have a great night, everybody. Yeah, okay. Thanks, bye. Bye. bye.